This uh, meeting is called to order. Exactly one year ago today, the landmark Supreme Court decision in Massachusetts versus EPA made it clear that the EPA had to address climate change issues. The Court held, uh, first, that greenhouse gases are pollutants that can be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Two, that under the Clean Air Act, the EPA administrator must judge whether these emissions cause or contribute to air pollution which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. And three, if the EPA administrator does make a positive endangerment finding, it must regulate greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles. In May of last year, the President directed EPA and other agencies to prepare a regulatory response to the Massachusetts versus EPA case. In June of last year, Administrator Johnson told the Select Committee his response would be made public by the end of 2007. The response was to consist of an endangerment finding and a regulatory proposal to regulate these emissions from motor vehicles. Although depositions by congressional staff and media reports indicate that EPA completed its work and submitted its proposals to OMB and other Federal agencies for review, EPA did not release its work as planned. In January, when I requested that Administrator Johnson appear before the Select Committee to update us on EPA's efforts, I also requested these documents which the Administrator initially agreed to provide. However, shortly before last month's hearing and again during his appearance before the Select Committee, Administrator Johnson made it clear both in writing and verbally that the EPA would not provide the documents after all. The EPA's reasons for not providing the requested documents are flimsy and lack merit. Indeed, the EPA's purported reasons have been recognized by no committee of Congress as a basis to withhold documents, regardless of which party or member was sitting in the chair. The excuse of not providing documents because they would be confusing to the public is invalid and borderlines on insulting. And it simply is no answer to say that the documents are pre-decisional. That provides no lawful basis for a refusal to supply documents relevant to a lawful congress congressional inquiry. I had expected to resolve this dispute with the administrator without having to resort to this action. But I am disappointed to report that EPA has made no effort to accommodate the Committee's request and has done nothing but repeated excuses uh, that are without legal meaning. The members of the Committee should know that I do not take the issuance of a subpoena lightly. In my 32 years as a member of Congress and my many years chairing subcommittees in both the Energy and Commerce and Resources Committees, this is the first time that I have ever found it necessary to issue a subpoena. But the EPA has placed us in that position, and so we must go forward. The Select Committee has both the right and the responsibility to obtain these documents so that we can understand exactly how EPA is planning on responding to the Supreme Court's landmark decision. I urge my colleagues to vote to uphold the rights of the Committee uh, and the House by supporting this motion. That completes the opening statement of the Chair. I now turn to recognize the Ranking Member, the gentleman uh, from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, let me state that I support this Select Committee resolution, and I thank the Chair for working with me to refine the resolution's language. I agree the documents which the Select Committee is seeking from the EPA are within our authority and that the agency has no legal basis to deny providing us with the documents short of asserting executive privilege, which they have not done. However, I do want to take a few minutes to share some of my other thoughts and concerns about the use of these subpoenas. Generally, I believe that subpoenas should be rarely used. In the 10 years during which I chaired two standing committees of the House, the Committee on Science during the last four years of the Clinton administration and the Committee on the Judiciary during the first six years of the Bush administration, I never issued a subpoena. 
I did on occasion remind representatives of those two administrations that Congress has constitutional responsibilities with respect to oversight of the executive branch. And I used that leverage to negotiate meaningful testimony and documentation to allow my committees to discharge their oversight obligations. However, I believe that the actual use of subpoenas can and should be a rarely used oversight device. The documents this subpoena seeks from the EPA are drafts and part of an ongoing Supreme Court mandated regulatory process. I am always hesitant about Congress intervening in a rulemaking process. If we know better than the regulatory agency what the answer is, then we should pass legislation to mandate that answer. Administrator Johnson testified before us three weeks ago that as a result of the enactment of last December's Energy Independence and Security Act, he was reexamining from a broader perspective both the Clean Air Act and other authorities to regulate greenhouse gases. In other words, the rules changed as a result of the December enactment. Since that hearing, he has announced his intention to use an advance notice of proposed rulemaking as the agency considers the specific effects of climate change and the potential regulation of greenhouse gas emissions from stationary and mobile sources. This leads me to wonder what the exact value of the documents sought by the subpoena will be, because they were a part of preliminary rulemaking and what use they are to us now. Except as historical documents showing where the agency's preliminary thinking was going last year, they would seem to have only limited use to us as policymakers. Perhaps these documents will serve as great political fodder for the majority to use in attacking the administration, but I don't think they are going to be very relevant as a result of December's uh, energy bill being signed into law. In any case, I have long stated my opposition to the fragmented use of statutes like the Clean Air Act and the Endangered Species Act to confront the challenges of global warming. This was not the purpose for which they were enacted. Only comprehensive legislation rather than fragmented regulations are likely to result in meaningful actions. In conclusion, I will support this resolution for institutional reasons, though I do have concern that these documents are being sought for political purposes and will have only limited use in helping the Congress develop realistic policies to confront global warming. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time is yielded back. Um, and so now, um, the business before the committee is to consider a motion to be offered by the chair with respect to the issuance of subpoenas to the EPA. The clerk will read the motion. Resolved that the chairman of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming is directed to issue subpoenas to the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency as necessary to obtain each of the following documents. I ask unanimous consent to One, the uh, regu draft ask, regulatory proposal that was I A, ask, prepared. I ask unanimous consent to suspend the reading of resolution. It is all before uh, the members and has been presented to the uh, members for their um, inspection before, uh, uh, before the vote. Uh, the, uh, and without objection, um, uh, so ordered, the resolution will be considered as read. Um, are there any other members seeking recognition for the purpose of speaking on Chair sees none. Are there any members um, seeking to make uh, amendments to this motion? Chair sees none. Then the question before the committee is whether it will adopt the motion to authorize the chairman to issue subpoenas to the EPA. The clerk will read the roll. Mr. Blumenauer. Aye. Mr. Blumenauer votes aye. Mr. Inslee. Aye. Mr. Inslee votes aye. Mr. Larson. Aye. Mr. Larson votes aye. Ms. Solis. Ms. Solis votes aye. Ms. Hertha Sandlin. Aye. Ms. Hertha Sandlin votes aye. Mr. Cleaver. Aye. Mr. Cleaver votes aye. Mr. Hall. Aye. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. McNerney. Aye. Mr. McNerney votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. Shattig. Mr. Walden. Aye. Ms. Mr. Walden votes aye. Mrs. Miller. Ms. Mr. Sullivan. Mrs. Blackburn. Are there any other members seeking permission to vote? Mr. Markey. Uh, votes aye. 
Mr. Markey votes aye. The total is uh, 12 votes aye, no, zero votes for nay. Then the motion is agreed to. The staff is directed to draw up the necessary subpoena powers in consultation with the House Office of General Counsel and will cause those to be served on the EPA Administrator. And copies of those documents will be delivered to okay. every member of the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that the resolution calls for the concurrence of the ranking member, so I would like to see them too. There will be nothing that occurs that um, is in any way at variance with what is in the um, And uh, the committee um, uh, thanks all of the members for uh, their uh, cooperation. And, uh, and with that, we will turn to the other business before uh, the committee, which is a hearing on um, uh, climate change and aviation. And uh, again, with the thanks of the committee, uh, in the, um, the, the hearing on uh, aviation. So this, um, this uh, second hearing today is called to order the Select Committee uh, uh, analyzes all causes of global warming. It cannot let aviation fly under the radar. Aviation emissions currently amount for 12 percent of U.S. transportation emissions and 3 percent of emissions nationally and worldwide. The impact of these emissions cannot be ignored. The CO2, nitrous oxide and particulate matter leaked into high altitudes uh, alter our climate. Scientific debate does not center on whether CO2 is the stratosphere, uh, in the stratosphere is harmful. It questions how much more harmful CO2 may be when compounded by other aviation emissions in the stratosphere. The aviation industry has improved emission uh, output through technology, but the rapidly increasing number of flights will exacerbate aviation emissions. The FAA has forecasted over a billion commercial passengers annually by 2015, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has predicted that even assuming efficiency and infrastructure improvements, aviation emissions could double or triple by 2050. Aviation must answer for the heat, trapping, heat trappings of their own success. Today's hearing on aviation emissions should not be viewed as a mere blip on the screen. States, cities and organizations have petitioned the EPA to regulate aviation greenhouse gas emissions. Aviation fuels are currently being considered under a cap and trade system in Congress. The European Commission plans to integrate domestic and U.S. flights into the e EU trading system. As local governments and other nations move to limit the impact of aviation on the environment, Congress cannot linger in a holding pattern. The witnesses before us today address the three factors responsible for aviation emissions, operations, technologies and fuel. Regulating fuel emissions largely falls to the Environmental Protection Agency. The Federal Aviation Administration can discuss its vision to streamline aviation operations for more efficient flights. And the Natural Resources Defense Council's Transportation Fuel Director can discuss aviation fuel options and consequences. The Air Transport Association and International Air Transport Association can discuss different approaches to aviation cap and trade regulations. Virgin Atlantic General Counsel Jill Brady was unable to attend today's hearing but submitted written testimony discussing Virgin's ground baking commercial flight using biofuels and support for an international cap and trade scheme. I encourage the public to read her testimony as well as the testimony. As aviation's contribution to global warming creeps up the IPCC charts, we cannot wait until it becomes a bigger threat. At one time, the number of automobiles on the road was not a significant contributor to global warming emissions. But even after that harm was established, decades of inattention and legislative delays led us to the environmental <laughs> emergency that formed this select committee. With that in mind, I look forward to hearing everyone's testimony today. And now I turn to recognize the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for scheduling this hearing today, and I look forward to learning more about this topic. 
One of my many curiosities about this topic, perhaps the most pressing, is why the aviation industry is a major focus in the global warming debate. By all measures, aviation produces just a tiny fraction of the world's greenhouse gases. In the U.S., aviation accounts for only 3 percent of emissions compared to electricity generation, ground transport, industry and agriculture, all of which produce many times more greenhouse gases. Furthermore, the aviation industry has been doing a good job of improving fuel efficiency, because if they didn't do that, they'd all be out of business with fuel prices being what they are. And it didn't take heavy-handed government regulations such as cap and trade to make it happen. In the past four years, U.S. airlines have improved fuel efficiency by 11 percent, mostly due to the market-driven pressures of the high price of oil and the lower value of the dollar. This is positive progress, and the industry deserves commendation for this improvement. Despite these numbers, the European Union wants to include aviation in its emission trading scheme, which would clearly throw additional costs onto the airline industry. I don't understand why government regulators want to punish an industry that's already making good progress without the pressure of regulation. Then again, I don't understand how hampering the economy with regulatory schemes like cap and trade is the proper way to confront climate change in the first place. Last month, an EU commissioner said that if the U.S. didn't join the EU emission trading scheme or apply a similar program to U.S. airlines by 2010, EU states would begin denying incoming flights in 2012. I wonder if this threat also applies to India and China each of which has a growing airline industry to meet the demand of their growing economies. In fact, testimony today will show that these two countries will build 100 new airports over the next decade to meet the demand. And no, India and China don't have admissions trading system of their own. And it doesn't look like they're going to get one soon. There may be advances in clean fuel technology that help reduce airlines' greenhouse gas output even further. As I've said many times, technological advancement must be part of any plan to confront climate change. However, I do not believe that any advances in fuel technology should come at the expense of safety. There are already some concerns that biofuels can cause engines to stall, which is a safety risk I believe is too great, especially considering the airline's minimal contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. If large-scale changes are needed in the aviation industry, the UN's International Civil Aviation Organization is the best place to address these questions. And it isn't often that I embrace a UN organization to do anything. However, in this case, the UN is taking a more thoughtful approach to aviation emissions and technology than is the European Union. When it comes to global warming, many people cry that the sky is falling. <laughs> But I worry that if we make careless changes to the airline industry, it will be the planes falling from the sky. I believe it's more prudent at this point to recognize the good work that the airlines are doing before we force changes that could jeopardize both the safety and economic health of the industry. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. In response, why we're concerned about a. Uh, an industry that has only 3 percent, I just think we all have to get on the bus, everybody, whether we're 3 percent or half a percent or a tenth of percent, we all got to get on the bus. We're not going to solve this problem unless every industry participates. That includes Congress. That includes us in our homes. That includes the airline industry. So it's hardly going to be an excuse. And obviously, I'm from Seattle and aerospace industry. And you know, you might think a hometown team would say, well, we'll just ignore that industry. But you can't ignore any industry. So I have uh, good news to report to the committee, and we're going to hear about it today. I, there's some bragging rights coming out of Seattle that uh, to do my job of bragging about my hometown team. Let me brag about them a little bit. The first uh, biofuels-operated commercial jet airplane, the jet, was manufactured in Seattle with the Boeing 747 using standardized engines with no modifications whatsoever to the engines. It flew on February 24th. Uh, uh, 237 miles from London to Amsterdam, safely, didn't fall out of the sky, no injuries reported, and it was a smooth flight. And it used a fuel generated by Imperial Biofuels in Grays Harbor, Washington, uh, used uh, 3,175 gallons of biofuels. It was produced by Imperium. This was kind of an all-Washington state uh, project with help by Sir Richard 
Branson. And it just shows what the power of the human intellect can do in aerospace, and we look forward to more successes. I also want to point out in the aerospace industry, our ground operations are a part of this as well. And there's uh, really some good things we can do on the ground. A Seattle Tacoma International Airport has done some great things reducing its CO2 emissions in its operations. They have, um, you, they're using 25 percent green power. They've reduced their electrical consumption 24 percent. And they're implementing a way to use preconditioned air so you don't have to use the airplane engines to condition the air in the airplane while they're sitting on the tarmac. So we're developing some great systemic things in Seattle, and I look forward to hearing about more success. Thanks. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson. I want to thank the chairman and uh, thank him for <clears throat> holding this hearing today. And uh, I also uh, bring with me some uh, Boggy and Ray's uh, bragging rights uh, from uh, the aerospace industry. And, uh, my hometown is uh, that of East Hartford, Connecticut, uh, where uh, my dad worked at Pratt Whitney for 37 years, where we can eagle flying, as we say, uh, from East Hartford, and uh, proud as well, and I think all the more reason to have hearings like this and to set standards and goals to see the kind of technological advances that, in fact, uh, can be made uh, that are going to help us all in our effort to uh, limit the carbon footprint that we have and create uh, greater uh, efficiencies that will improve our travel and, of course, uh, save overall dollars. The uh, Pratt Whitney uh, announced uh, the successful uh, design of uh, engines that will be on uh, Mitsubishi and uh, uh, technology that reduces air emissions 40 percent below the 1996 uh, regulations and saving taxpayers $600,000 each year due to lower operating and maintenance cost and improved productivity. It does, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, beg the question, too, you know, perhaps at a future date we could have the uh, Air Force uh, in here and the Pentagon, you know, in terms of listening to their testimony in as much as they are the largest consumers of, of uh, energy in the United States government system, and the Air Force obviously is the largest consumer of fuel uh, in the country. And with that, um, I look forward to hearing from our uh, testimony and thank the chairman for holding this insightful hearing. Thank you. I appreciate the gentleman from Connecticut. And now we turn and recognize the gentleman of from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, Mr. Larson uh, and Mr. Inslee pretty much covered what I would say in an opening comment. Uh, uh, my opening comment, I, I would only add, uh, and then yield back the balance of my time, uh, that I think probably uh, there are a lot of questions that have not been uh, answered. Uh, and I think that we've got to go through a, a period of, of examining what happens uh, to the pollution at a higher altitude, I mean, whether there is a greater impact, even though we have 3 percent emissions, it could be uh, that, that it creates problems of its own. We, we don't know. And I, so I think it is appropriate that we uh, examine it and I appreciate the hearing and, and our guests who have come here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cleaver. With that, I uh, recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, uh, uh, also would like to uh, welcome our witnesses and uh, uh, thank the chairman for holding this, this hearing today um, and reassure our ranking member that uh, I, for one, uh, do not, as a member of this committee, want to punish uh, an industry that's already done a lot uh, in their own interest and also in the environment's interest by installing uh, winglets or by removing magazines, which add up to a sur surprising amount of weight, actually. Uh, I don't think there's been too many customer complaints about some of the magazines that have been removed from uh, from airlines, um, and uh, you know any efforts that are being made not only in the air but on the ground, as I understand, to reduce uh, consumption of uh, uh, green or release of greenhouse gases from uh, ground equipment that's involved with uh, loading uh, airlines with uh, baggage or um, food services or what have you. Uh, Proud to say that in my district, uh, Stewart Airport, which has just uh, been taken over by the Port Authority of New Jersey, is going to be, according to their announcement at their uh, uh, at their big press conference, 
they would like to be the first carbon negative airport and compensate with uh, solar and geothermal and passive uh, uh, features and so on and with using alternative fuels as much as possible on the ground uh, for the emissions that they release in the air. Now, that may be a big ticket and I admire them for uh, making such an ambitious announcement. Uh, and, and I wish them luck in, in meeting that goal and will do everything I can uh, to try to help. But um, I just think I, I agree with, uh, I guess it was Mr. Inslee who said that we all have to try, um, I as an individual, we as uh, members of uh, Congress and, and you as members of your companies and your industry, um, in order to have a chance at uh, reaching the goals that this committee is constituted to uh, uh, to find a route to, those being energy independence and uh, to s stop the advance of uh, climate change, that uh, we all must do our part. And I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that the uh, uh, industry we're hearing from today has already done a lot uh, uh, along those lines and uh, looking forward to hearing what else you think can be done and uh, yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman um, from New York for his uh words and uh, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to welcome the uh, panel here for their testimony. Uh, and I look at all the issues, uh, I look at this issue, like I look at all the issues surrounding global warming as not only a threat, but as an opportunity. Uh, in this case, uh, there is an opportunity to find ways to make the airline industry more efficient, which will ultimately save money. There's been some very good recommendations out there that uh, are worth pursuing. Uh, one by Mr. Lovins, uh, Amory Lovins, to uh, encourage the airline industry through tax uh, um, considerations to retire some of the older, more inefficient planes with new ones. Uh, that certainly wouldn't hurt the state of Washington. Uh, and there's all kinds of things I think that we can do to improve airline efficiency, uh, which would reduce greenhouse gases. So I look forward to uh, what this hearing might produce. Thank you very much. And I yield back to the chair. I thank the gentleman from California. And uh, uh, now uh, on to our panelists. And again, uh, we want to thank them for being here today. And uh, first, I'd uh, like to recognize as the uh, chair comes back and assumes his position, uh, Dan Elwell, the Assistant Administrator for Aviation Policy, Planning and Environment with the United States Federal Aviation Administration, and Mr. Bob Myers, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you both uh, for joining us. And with that, I yield to the Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, and Elwell, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Markey. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you, Congressman Sensenbrenner, and the members of the Select Committee. The environment is a page one issue, no matter where page one happens to be. It was a central theme of the FAA's annual forecast conference last month and the subject of Acting Administrator Sturgill's speech to the International Aviation Club. Whether you followed the proceedings in Bali or the recent meeting of the Group on International Aviation and Climate Change in Montreal, one thing is clear. Aviation's contribution to global climate change is getting a lot of attention, which is as it should be. And that's why I'm so pleased to share with you today both U.S. Aviation's exceptional environmental record to date and our plans to make it even better. The bottom line for us at the FAA, and indeed for every citizen of this great land, is that when you have the opportunity to do something for the environment, you do it. This issue should neither be partisan nor polemic. As global citizens, we've got to move forward with each opportunity. At the FAA, that is specifically what's happening. We recognize the significance of taking care of the planet. In a day and age when aviation activity is on the verge of doubling, where annual passenger totals will soar past a billion, it is imperative that we take steps that will make a lasting difference. Those steps form the very foundation of our plan for the next generation of air traffic control. NextGen is known as our blueprint for the future. It also happens to be our plan to keep aviation green. With the aviation industry experiencing record growth, aircraft emissions remain a central environmental challenge as they contribute to global climate change and impact lo local air quality and noise near airports. From a business standpoint, 
Failure to address these concerns could slow or stop the growth of aviation and the benefits it brings to our nation. Aviation accounts for roughly 10 million jobs in the U.S. and over 5 percent of our national GDP. For the record, as already said, aviation greenhouse gas emissions represent less than 3 percent of the world's total. Nevertheless, we must do what it takes to reduce that number. To provide some context, there is some good news. When you compare 2006 to the year 2000, U.S. commercial aviation moved 12 percent more passengers and 22 percent more freight while burning less fuel. Between 2000 and 2006, aviation emissions in the U.S. actually declined, that's right, declined by about 4 percent reducing our carbon output by about 6 million tons. During the same period, European aviation emissions increased some 30 percent. In light of this data, recent rhetoric from the EU threatening to cut or reduce U.S. flights to Europe if we don't pay for our carbon is at best impolitic, at worst hypocritical. It's not surprising that the rest of the world rejected the European plan during the 36th International Civil Aviation Organization Assembly in Montreal last year. We, like most of the world, believe that the most efficient means of reducing aviation emissions is to reduce the amount of fuel that is burned. The aviation industry has made and continues to make significant improvements. Aircraft fuel efficiency has improved 70 percent over the last 40 years, and it's only getting better. On a per-passenger mile basis, Boeing's new 787 will be as fuel efficient as today's subcompact hybrid car. These advances are taking place without a single government-imposed emission standard for CO2 and no mention of a cap. In the past four years alone, U.S. airlines have improved their fuel efficiency by 11 percent. U.S. airlines have voluntarily committed to an additional 30 percent improvement by 2025. With that said, forecasts are one thing. Getting there is quite another. But with the price of oil over $100 a barrel, the motivation to reduce fuel consumption has never been greater. But back to what the FAA is doing. We have already implemented a program to reduce vertical separation between aircraft at high altitudes. It's saving about 3 million tons of CO2 per year. We're redesigning airspace. We're altering the routes planes use to descend into airports, both here and overseas. That'll allow us to use smooth, continuous approaches that burn less fuel and make less noise while doing so. In short, any place and any way we can make a difference, we are. And as we head into the design, development, and execution of NextGen, I think that getting to zero emissions growth is a reasonable goal. In my written testimony, I describe the five-pillar approach that will get us there. It takes advantage of efforts like our Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative, the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative, FAA's proposed research consortium called CLEAN, and the Partnership for Air Transportation Noise and Emissions Reduction. Aviation has faced many challenges in the past. We've solved them by coming together to produce collaborative efforts that have changed the way we operate as an agency and have literally changed the way Americans fly. I'm confident that we'll continue with that in the environmental challenges ahead. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Mr. Elwell, very much. much. Our, our uh, second witness on the first panel is uh, Bob Myers, the Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Office of Air and Radiation at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, Mr. Myers and I have been walking around Beginning of time almost, huh? <clears throat> Something like that, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I'm sorry, your mic cut out. I could oh, not. Oh, it did. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, when did you start working up here in the Rayburn building? When I started in the Rayburn, I, I started working for Congress in the late 1970s. 1970s, yeah. Just about the same time I arrived. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, we welcome you here. Yes. And we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee concerning the important issue of aviation emissions and climate change. On December 4th and December 31st of last year, EPA received two petitions to set greenhouse gas emission standards for aircraft engines under the Clean Air Act. 
One petition was filed by several states, the City of New York, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, and the District of Columbia. The other was filed by several environmental organizations. Uh, the petitions raised similar but not identical issues. Uh, the relief requested in the petition centers on the finding of endangerment and adoption of Cleaner Act regulations. As Administrator Johnson recently informed the committee, EPA intends to issue an advance notice of proposed rulemaking later this spring. This AMPR will cover a variety of issues arising from the Supreme Court's decision in Mass v. EPA, and among the issues addressed, the AMPR will seek comment and relevant data concerning the two aviation petitions the agency has received. The AMPR will also seek comment and data with respect to additional petitions the agency has received concerning non-road and marine sources. Through the NPR process, EPA expects to gain valuable information and public insights regarding greenhouse gas emissions from such, such sources, air connections among various Clean Air Act provisions, and possible regulatory requirements. Your letter of invitation requested that I address four issues. Some of the questions posited were similar to the questions previously received by the agency that were addressed in my letter to the Committee of, of March 31st. In today's testimony, I would like to provide further response to your concerns and specifically information regarding emissions, potential use of biofuels, FAA coordination, and the EU emissions trading scheme. Uh, very briefly, the compounds emitted from aircraft jet engines that directly relate to climate change are carbon dioxide and small amounts of methane and nitrous oxide. There are also emissions which more indirectly affect radiation forcing and climate. As detailed in my re written statement, uh, the work of the International Panel on Climate Change, reports of the Council of the International Civil Aviation Organization, and other sources have examined these emissions. Overall, aircraft operations in the U.S. are estimated to account for about 10 percent of greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. transportation sector and uh, approximately 3 percent of total U.S. GHG emissions. Section 231 of the Clean Air Act uh, gives EPA authority to determine whether aircraft emissions contribute to air pollution, which may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare, and to set emission standards following a positive finding. Section 232 of the Act provides FAA with the authority to certify aircraft engines for emission purposes and to enforce compliance with EPA's standards. EPA has utilized this authority on several occasions, including the 1982 standards for HC or hydrocarbons, 1997 standards for NOx and CO, and further NOx standards in 2005. These standards essentially cover criteria pollutants and precursors for purposes of improving local air quality. With respect to fuel, um, commercial aircraft use a petroleum-based fuel commonly referred to as Jet A kerosene. In 2006, the air travel industry and FAA established the Commercial Aviation and Alternative Fuels Initiative to explore the potential use of alternative fuels for aircraft uh, for energy security and possible environmental improvements. And since the FAA is uh, primary authority in this area, that I, I would defer to the FAA to address their ongoing work in this area. Overall, uh, as mentioned, U.S. aviation emissions have declined in recent years. Moreover, it's likely that aircraft fuel efficiency will improve in the future due to technology developments for lighter and more aerodynamic aircraft, as well as more efficient engines. In the longer term, the expected increase in air traffic and lead times that are necessary for technology change and deployment could affect recent trends. As indicated previously, our upcoming NPR will provide a context in which these issues can be assessed. With respect to coordination with the FAA, various offices within EPA and FAA are in frequent contact regarding aviation and environmental issues, including the Next Generation Air Transport System Plan. EPA has had substantial interactions with FAA in the development of aviation GHG inventories, and we expect to continue our coordination with FAA in developing our responses to the two administrative petitions. Finally, you asked whether EPA was examining how the U.S. might comply with the EU trading scheme. As my letter of March 31st addresses this issue, uh, I would just generally state that the EPA technical staff have provided background data and information regarding emissions and cap and trade programs during an air agency process. Again, thank you, and Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for this opportunity. And this concludes my prepared statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Myers, uh, very much. And uh, the chair will now recognize himself for uh, five minutes of questioning. Uh, Elwell, the um, Next Gen program was formed uh, to plan for the future of aviation. 
in both your testimony and your response to the Select Committee's letter last year, uh, your environmental efforts seem to be tangential rather than central to the future of aviation. Given the future of carbon constrained economy and the inevitability of some sort of European aviation emissions cap and trade system, uh, how is it that you have not focused on uh, global warming emissions? plan for a rapidly increasing aviation Well, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, in referencing NextGen, um, we have an integrated work plan. Uh, it is a rather, rather large document, but we have devoted um, an entire section of the integrated work plan, which is basically uh, the template from which we will um, implement NextGen. Uh, and the, the chapter is dedicated to environmental considerations and how we uh, will mitigate our environmental footprint. So uh, I, I wouldn't characterize um, our treatment of the environmental issue with regard to next gen as tangential. Um, does the FAA see coal to liquid fuels as the future of jet fuel? Well, coal to liquid fuels um, is uh, one area of alternative fuels being looked at. And the initiative I mentioned in my testimony, CAFI, or Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuel Initiative, uh, is dedicated to the, the furthering or the, or the, um, the uh, proposal for alternative fuels that have a net decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. So to the extent to which coal to liquid can achieve that, then yes, we would be for it. But there's, there's as you are well aware, uh, sequestration issues uh, and uh, life cycle issues. Now, the um, uh, Virgin Atlantic and Continental are testing uh, biofuels in their planes. Uh, Air New Zealand is uh, funding research into biofuels. Uh, what work is being done to support biofuel uh, development agency, uh, aside from a biofuels demonstration test flight? <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, uh, as part of our um, central uh, participation in CAFI and in the uh, Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative and our partnership program for lower emissions, um, we are intricately involved uh, both in centers of excellence with university research. Uh, again, uh, CAFI and ACCRI in all aspects of alternative fuel uh, research. Uh, Mr. Myers, as you point out in your testimony, um, EPA's uh, decision on whether to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from the aviation sector under Section 231 of the Clean Air Act depends on an identical determination as Massachusetts versus EPA as to whether the emissions cause or contribute to air pollution that may reasonably be anticipated to endanger public health or welfare. We know from EPA staff depositions to Congress that EPA finished the endangerment finding for motor vehicles and found that indeed EPA did believe that these emissions are dangerous. Uh, since you have concluded that these emissions are dangerous when they come out of vehicles that uh, drive on the roads, would it not be uh, would it uh, not be arbitrary to conclude that these emissions are not dangerous when they come out of uh, vehicles that fly in the skies? You can turn on your microphone, please. Thank you for the question. Um, I, th I think uh, I might um, say that the, the documents that you are referring to were draft documents. Uh, we have had, had correspondence with the committee with respect to these documents. Um, so as draft uh, documents, uh, any um, views and documents would not be conclusions. Well, if, if, you, if you do formally conclude that greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles are dangerous, is there any reason um, that EPA would not conclude that emissions coming from aviation are not also as dangerous? Um, I probably learned a long time ago not to engage in hypotheticals. So I, I, on that hypothetical, I am not uh, available to give you a detailed answer. I, I would say very clearly the, the endangerment language in 231 is, is very similar to that with the ICTA petition in two, 
in Section 202, and we, uh, when we look at uh, greenhouse gases, uh, we understand which pollutants they are, and they're emitted from both mobile sources, uh, on-road, uh, as well as off-road, as well as aircraft. And do you plan on including the text of the endangerment finding you've already completed for vehicle emissions in the advance notice of proposed rulemaking? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're uh, just initiating work now on the NPRM, so decisions regarding uh, final documents and final support documents have not been made at this point in time. I think as our letter to the committee uh, and other committees on the Hill indicates uh, that we plan to uh, utilize the work that was uh, performed by EPA over the last uh, year in, in response to the greenhouse gas petition and with reference to the President's 2010 initiative. I thank you. Uh, Chair now turns and recognizes the uh, ranking member, the gentleman. No questions. Chair recognizes the um, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Elwell, it, it, do you see a conflict between some move to reduce emissions and a strong safety record? Is there a conflict between trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and safety? <clears throat> Mr. Cleaver, if you're asking are they mutually exclusive, clearly not. Um, we can uh, pursue both, uh, and, and, uh, and we clearly have. We are uh, currently in the safest period uh, in, that we've ever seen, and we also are just wrapping up a decline in fuel burn despite the fact that we've carried more people in freight. So I think the record is clear that we can do both. I, I raise a question only because uh, there was discussion about <laughs> planes falling. and uh, I, I thought it, it might be important for us to, to just get that on the record, that, that the committee is not saying ignore public safety, uh, concentrate on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what do you, what, what is the future, um, uh, based on your analysis, uh, in uh, the, uh, the aviation industry uh, with regards to, to uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions? And, I mean, and I'm not sure whether there, who does the, uh, whether FAA or, or whoever, whomever would look at the um, upper atmospheric uh, emissions and whether there's a difference there than, than uh, on Earth. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about that or, or knowledge about uh, whether that has ever been looked into or whether you believe that it ought to be looked into? Um, well, we certainly believe it, it needs to be looked into. Um, in my written testimony, I go through the pillars of our plan to go forward, and the first pillar is a better understanding of the impacts of the various uh, uh, emissions that combustion produces. One thing we know for sure is that CO2 is not altitude dependent, so there is no uh, multiplying effect of CO2 uh, wherever it's, it's emitted. Um, and the belief, and, and it has been posed before, that uh, the other pollutants uh, have some magnification effect at altitude uh, has recently, um, the uh, IPCC has actually um, most recently said that, that the science is so uncertain as to that, quote, multiplier as to them uh, not giving one, actually. And so our involvement in ACCRI, um, Aviation Climate Change Research Initiative, is, is focused on exactly those issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses. Um, Mr. Myers, I wanted to ask you, uh, you, you uh, in your written testimony, you mentioned the uh, Fisher Tropes synthetic, which is uh, uh, Produced, was produced by the Nazis for various fuels, including uh, aviation fuel, I believe, uh, during World War II. Um, and uh, the Fisher Tropes reaction is apparently, I believe there are a couple of studies I've heard about that are going on now uh, to pull carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, process the carbon in it into a liquid fuel uh, upon which uh, combustion releases a similar amount of carbon dioxide back into the air. It's a carbon neutral um, 
uh, process, which would provide us, if, if one uses in parts of the country or parts of the world where the sun shines almost constantly or where the wind blows almost constantly, using those renewables as the energy to drive the Fischer-Tropsch reaction. Um, are you aware of any uh, studies along those lines? And, uh, uh, what are your thoughts about I'd, it? I'd be happy uh, to get back to the record on specific studies that we may be, be, be aware of. Uh, my office is uh, primarily the regulatory office at EPA, and we have an office of research and development. Uh, but generically, uh, obviously, it's going to depend. Uh, Fisher Tropes is a process. It's going to depend on the feedstock, and you know you can use Fisher Tropes with with coal, and has been done for some time, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, both in, uh, in World War II and in South Africa in more recent years. So it, 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 I would say this is probably theoretic, theoretically possible, but uh, I would love to get back for the record with more specifics. Okay. I'm, I'm curious about this because I've been hearing about it. And if you do an inter internet search for Fisher Tropes, all this, you know, a lot of sites show up with different things on them. And you can't believe everything you read on the internet. but. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if it were true? I'm hoping uh, uh, that uh, that it is. And uh, Mr. Elwell, I don't know if you want to uh, comment on that since uh, Mr. Myers deferred to you on that part of his testimony. Um, and I had one other question for you also. And no, to the Fisher Tropes, I'm, I, that uh, is out of my realm. Okay. I mean, it just seems to me that uh, using an existing carbon fuel like coal, obviously, uh, is something we know how to do with that process to create liquid fuels, but we also know so far anyway that we're faced with either sequestering massive amounts of carbon dioxide or, uh, or uh, you know, using a fuel that could already be used you know, in other ways, whereas um, you know, storing solar or some other renewable See, the big problem people always say about sun, the sun and the wind is you, you can't always predict when it's going to shine and you can't always predict when it's going to blow. But if you can store it and basically use the liquid as a battery or you know, use hydrogen as a battery in a similar way by separating uh, uh, water into hydrogen and oxygen and then burn the hydrogen, that's not something I'm advocating for, for airplane fuel, but it is something that could be used for generation of electricity, for instance. And this is a similar thing with Fisher Tropes. Uh, if a carbon, a carbon dioxide neutral process could uh, be uh, developed using it. The other question I had, uh, you mentioned uh, continuous descent uh, as part of uh, next gen. And um, I sat on the Aviation Committee of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure. And been, I've been very interested in that because particularly in my district, we have a couple of uh, uh, towns, uh, town of Pound Ridge and the town of Warwick in the 19th Congressional District that are um, being affected or, or feel that they are being affected already by the New York airspace redesign. And they're hearing that stepping down of planes going from descent to hover to descent to hover as they wait to be cleared uh, for the next 2,000 foot drop. Um, and of course, the engines have to rev up to hold altitude and then rev down to descend. And uh, once they can get onto continuous descent, um, they uh, hopefully will be less noticed. They might be making as much noise sort of on average, but it's that change in pitch that uh, I think is especially noticed by people out in the country and uh, uh, where they're used to the peace and quiet. Uh, is this something that can be done uh, in any parts of, uh, for instance, the New York Air uh, uh, airspace uh, before full Im implementation of next gen? Um, next gen, before full implementation, it can be done. In fact, over 25 percent of the approaches right now in LA are using CDA. Um, and uh, we, we, we are putting it in where we can. Obviously, probably one of the most difficult places to do it consistently is in the Northeast sector, sector which is why the, the redesign is so important. But once, as you mentioned, once next gen is fully um, implemented, uh, our hope is to have CDA be the norm uh, and step down uh, arrivals would be would be the exception. And, and you're right, the, uh, the ability to go to idle from altitude and bring up your power uh, half a mile from the threshold, huge emissions benefits, um, and below 6,000 feet, about a 30 percent reduction in overall noise. So it's, it's good both for noise and for uh, CO2 emissions, and that's what, we're, that's what we're after. Uh, my time is done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Elwell, if you wanted to uh, do a great job on future gen, what kind of resources would you need? 
Well, <clears throat> uh, a little bit over a year ago, the um, FA, the administration, proposed our next gen reauthorization bill, um, and it 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 offered some financing reform initiatives that would, uh, we believe, allow us to uh, pay for and implement NextGen um, as quickly as we're able. Uh, it had some dedicated funding for NextGen. Um, obviously, that legislation has, has uh, lagged some, uh, but we absolutely need your cooperation and partnership, um, Congress, in uh, the proper and timely funding for the, the capital expenditures for NextGen and for- can, can you give me a number? That number? Yeah. Um, we had in our proposal a uh, plan to spend $4.6 billion over five years mm -hmm. just on next gen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the President's budget supports that. So that's, that's what we're asking for. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Meyer, in January, the Select Committee sent you a letter asking about the EPA's commitment to aviation emissions and climate change. Your reply, which we received two days ago, stated that uh, IRPA has not taken a formal stance on the effects of aviation on climate change. Uh, when will you address this issue, and will it be separate from an endangerment finding? Uh, we will be addressing these issues as well as other issues affecting climate change in the context of ANPRN. Okay, so in, in, you'll be doing it in the context of the announcement that you made last week? Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's uh, helpful to us. Um, does the gentleman from uh, Missouri have any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One, one other question. Uh, I, I was intrigued by uh, Mr. Hall's comment about the uh, airport in, in his district. Uh, is, is that something, for either of you, is that something that, that you uh, believe to be possible, and if so, uh, is it something that you would encourage where uh, airports would, would move toward becoming uh, carbon neutral, at least in the ground operation with, with uh, uh, renewable fuels and, 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 and so forth? Uh, absolutely, absolutely encourage it. Um, in fact, we have uh, a program called Vail Voluntary Airport Lower uh, emissions program in which um, we allow airports to spend both airport improvement program monies and uh, passenger facility charge monies on electric vehicles, um, uh, tankering fuel as opposed to using trucks, um, all of the things that were mentioned uh, by your colleague, uh, electric plug into airplanes uh, for cooling and so that they don't need to turn on the engines. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is absolutely. Is there any, do you have any materials, any documentation, any that, that uh, we would be, that I'd, I would be able to, to, uh, to look at? Yes, we do. Yeah, sir. thank you very much. I, I would you. really like to, to see that. That's very intriguing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you. Um, and, uh, and just so I can clarify, is it possible, Mr. Myers, that when the advance notice for proposed rulemaking comes out that there won't be in something in there? Is, is one of the options that there won't be um, a, um, a consideration of, um, of uh, the endangerment finding or there won't be a, 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 an aviation component? Is that also possible? Uh, I, I um, we are in the process of, of drafting, so I, I think I should probably allow for any possibility during, during that process of drafting an interagency review. But uh, as the letter um, indicated uh, that was sent uh, to your committee and others, we were uh, looking at the NPRM as a vehicle to address. We, we not only have two aviation petitions, we have five other petitions uh, covering off-road, I'm sorry, and, and marine. And so, um, uh, traditionally, <clears throat> under processes when we get uh, petitions of this sort, uh, as we did last year when we had a petition with regard to leaded, leaded aircraft, general aviation air, aircraft gasoline, uh, we, we uh, solicit the information we need to address the petitions through an AMPRM. So that would be our intent with respect to uh, the aircraft petitions. Uh, relative to your question on endangerment, 
as I think uh, we, we referenced in the letter, that uh, we'd be looking both the science of climate change and, and that relationship to the endangerment finding uh, uh, that would occur, uh, and that uh, you know, would be in the context of the NPRM also. And is it possible that it will come out without any actual proposal of either endangerment or regulations for any sector? Well, uh, fairly much by definition, advance notice uh, does not normally conclude with a proposal. Uh, it's, 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 it's meant um, as an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, not as a formal notice of proposed rulemaking. So you're saying that it doesn't necessarily mean that either in the endangerment finding or something on, on well, I, I, I think I think what we tried to indicate was that during the course of our consideration over the last year, um, and as the committee knows, there was a lot of work done with reference to not only uh, vehicle emissions but the endangerment issue, and also not covered by the ICTA petition, the fuels. We we looked very heavily at the fuels. Um, this administrator has testified to with respect to previous hearings. Uh, we had the passage of the energy bill to take into consideration in December. So uh, in the context of our, our letter and explanation of our plan going forward uh, was to examine the interconnections in the Clean Air Act that occur both between the mobile and stationary sources. Obviously, with respect to the Massachusetts v. EPA decision, uh, the context of regulatory decisions are essentially uh, channeled through the funnel of endangerment finding uh, uh, in accordance with the opinion, in accordance with the structure of statute. So at the case at which this is proceeding, it is possible that the President could leave office, President Bush could leave office without any decision actually having been made on endangerment uh, and without any decision actually having been made on, in this one hearing's uh, uh, focus, uh, on the role of aviation and a solution to the problem. Well, I think the path forward the administrator has outlined is to issue an AMPRM uh, this spring, allowing for a uh, public comment period. And then uh, at that, the end of the process, uh, we would consider uh, on the basis of that information how best to respond to the Mass VEPA case and its implications throughout the Act. And how long is the comment period? Uh, that has not been established. Traditionally, in this, this area, one would look at uh, it's a substantial notice, a substantial issue. Uh, so normally, 60 days would be a uh, you know, rough, rough uh, minimum time. So 60 days for the advanced? Well, I, I, I want to be clear. We have not determined the, the period of actual public comment. I won't determine that. The administrator will determine that when he would sign the advanced notice. So uh, I, I, I'm just in normal practice. Uh, in order to give sufficient notice on, on large issues, and, and certainly the large issues with respect to Mass VEPA, you know, normally a 60 and perhaps 90-day process would, would, would be, uh, be appropriate. I, I just want to emphasize that's the decision that the Minister will make uh, at the time the uh, document is prepared. I guess from my perspective, there's been a lot of time to think about these issues since the um, court decision and my request to you would be to consider making this as brief a period of time as possible. I think people are ready to comment. I, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we will certainly um, convey that to the Administrator. Uh, I think uh, the balance here on any public comment period is between having a fulsome comment uh, and the ability of all parties to provide information as well as the uh, the uh, desire to move expeditiously. And I agree with that. And that has to be balanced against the concern that the EPA is just running out the clock on the Bush administration and doesn't intend on actually making any decision before President Lee's office. So it's, it's, uh, it's in that context that these decisions are being made about the length of time that uh, is going to be given for comment as opposed to action. So that's just the, you know, reality of it, I understand, but uh, I would caution that that will be perceptually how it will be viewed given the length of time that has been given thus far to think about the issue. So my time has expired. Uh, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Insel. Uh, thank you. Mr. Myers, was your agency, was EPA involved 
at all in the Air Force procurement decision about the uh, new tanker. We, uh, the Air Force decided to buy a tanker that uses 24 percent more fuel per mile of, of product than another aircraft that uses 24 percent more efficient and therefore has 24 percent less CO2 emissions. Were, you, were your agencies involved in that at all? Uh, I, I will be happy to check on that. I, I have no memory of any involvement by the Office of Air and Radiation. I, I doubt the Office of Radiation, but I just wonder if yeah. the EPA in general would have been involved. In, I, uh, I, I, I will need to check with the other offices, and we will be happy <clears> to provide that for the record. The reason I ask is that this is kind of a new issue to me, but it seems to me one thing we need to start thinking about in our federal procurement when we're buying aircraft to think about the CO2 emissions. And we had one product that, you know, reduces CO2 emissions by a, a full quarter, uh, and we didn't buy it. We bought a competitor, also happened to be significantly produced in Europe, which is another issue. Um, if you have any guidance on that, I'd be appreciative, because it seems to me that's something we ought to, we ought to be thinking about. Um, Mr. Elwell, I'm told that uh, the FAA's budget requested $300 million for environmental stewardship, but the primary goal of those were, was noise pollution and abatement, while only about $10 million was for researching new aircraft technology to help reduce emissions. Is that the situation, and is that really adequate um, to the task if we really want to reduce emissions? Well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, noise, or in my written testimony, noise remains uh, the major concern for local communities and local airports. And the, the money that you're talking about um, is uh, spent for insulation, for noise, for infrastructure noise mitigation. Um, we, I think, uh, the stewardship of every dollar that we get for uh, research, um, particularly in uh, uh, developmental research for design, engine and airframe, um, is spent primarily, we leverage every dollar, I should say, with our center of excellence, with um, the MIT-administered uh, partner program. So um, we can always uh, uh, do more um, with the challenges we have uh, budgetarily. Uh, I think we do the best uh, with, with what the uh, agency has. I'm sorry, the 90 percent of that is used in for infrastructure. Whose infrastructure improvements are you referring to? Uh, you mean the, the 300 million for Yes, noise? you said the bulk of it goes to infrastructure improvements of insulation and the like. Who's, whose infrastructure are you talking about? We're talking about uh, <clears throat> uh, residents and, and, and inhabitants within the noise-affected area of airports. <clears throat> well, we certainly would encourage you to think more aggressively on trying to embrace these new technologies because we think they're happening. Boeing has a new airplane, the 787 has 20 percent more fuel efficiency than any you know, uh, any other plane on the market. There's great things going on. Uh, by the way, could you give us, I was talking to somebody yesterday just by happenstance about turboprop technology that may be being looked at. You may, may have talked about this already. Do you have any thoughts about that or? Is that something that you're supporting? I'm told that it has it has markedly better fuel efficiency if we can get over some of the noise issues. I I I've read some of the same things um, and uh, don't don't know much more than what you're saying. Other than there is some advancements being made in turboprop technology, quieter <clears throat> turboprop engines, more fuel efficient turboprop engines, and um, uh, again anything uh, that reduces noise and emissions, um, we we are. In favor of, and I, and just to to add to your comment about the money that we're spending, um, we do, as I mentioned earlier, before you came in about our reauthorization proposal, uh, have significant um, increases in in funding for this fundamental or the the developmental research for uh, engines and airframe and for emissions. Well, we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Great. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. I don't know if the gentleman from Missouri has any other questions. Um, so we uh, uh, we thank you for um, your testimony and we look forward to working with uh, both of you um, uh, in the next uh, several months. We're going to be 
obviously paying very close attention uh, and um, escalating our level of attention to these uh, issues. Uh, but uh, I would ask both agencies to move quickly. The urgency of the problem is I think now unquestioned. And uh, I think the public and the world is looking to us to find uh, answers uh, to these questions in a timely, telescope time frame way. Uh, so we, we thank both of you for your testimony. Um, and our second panel, if they would uh, uh, move up as soon as the uh, first panel. Uh, uh, while you're doing that, I will, I will mention that both Virgin Atlantic and Boeing have submitted testimony for the record, and I ask the uh, unanimous consent uh, to include the testimony of Boeing and Virgin Atlantic uh, in the uh, record at, uh, at this point. So we welcome the uh, second panel. The second panel is, um, uh, is going to have as a lead-off witness uh, Mr. Jim May, who is the President and CEO of the Air Transport uh, Association. Um, he was named the, uh, the President and CEO uh, in February of 2003. Uh, prior to joining the ATA, uh, Mr. May served as Executive Vice President for the National Association of Broadcasters. So, our paths have been crossing since the beginning of time. And Mr. May's father was also a member of this, uh, of this body, of the United States Congress. So, um, so it, it's, it's uh, obviously a place that you are very familiar with and comfortable with. And we welcome you back. And whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, albeit in, as you point out, a somewhat different context. And it was my mother, actually, who served from uh, the great state of Washington. Really? Uh, for a number of years. What years, what, what years were they? 58 through 72. So she was one of the very first members, huh? One of the early members. And of course, the state of Washington has had a great tradition of women serving in uh, high elected positions. And we're all very proud of that. Yeah, I, I thought it was your father all these years. Uh, so whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I will emphasize first three points. First, commercial airlines are extremely greenhouse gas efficient. Second, we are proactively committed to further limiting greenhouse gas footprints and are actively, aggressively pursuing a comprehensive plan to achieve that outcome. Third, I think there is a critical role for the Federal Government to play, not for the industry, not against the industry, but rather with it. Commercial airlines uh, are extremely uh, greenhouse gas efficient. Aviation has, has a decidedly strong track record that I think is often overlooked or misstated. We contribute just 2 percent of domestic greenhouse gas emissions uh, today compared to 25 percent for the balance of the transportation industry. I think this is no small achievement given that we are essential to the economy, support nearly 9 percent of U.S. Uh, employment. Today's airplanes are not just smarter, they are quieter, cleaner, use less fuel than ever before, and we fly them smarter, as has been talked about today. U.S. airlines have been able to deliver more value by constantly improving fuel efficiency through fuel reinvestment in technology and efficient operations. We improved our efficiency over 100 percent between 78 and 2006 resulting in 2.3 metric tons, 2.3 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide savings, which is the equivalent, as the slide shows, of taking 17 million cars off the road in each of those years. While doing that, we burned 4 percent less fuel in 2006 than in 2000 in uh, year 2000, carried 12 percent more passengers, 22 percent more cargo. Our greenhouse gas efficiency compares favorably to other sectors and modes. Today our planes are as fuel efficient, as was testified by the FAA, as compact cars. And at the same time, we are carrying more goods and people over six times faster. We are highly motivated to continue this trend. Fuel is our largest cost center, averaging 50 percent of operating expenses, costing us four $41.2 billion in 2007 and projected to grow to $55 billion in 2008. 
So the market is sending the commercial airlines the price signal that some call for in legislation. As demand for air service grows, some growth in aviation is predicted. But that's a good thing. We're key to driving a more environmentally efficient economy, optimizing global value chains, and creating greater social and economic opportunities for people. Let's keep growth in context. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has determined that under the most likely scenario, carbon dioxide from global aviation in 2050 will grow to about 3 percent of total man-made carbon dioxide emissions from the 2 percent it is today. Now, at the core of our efforts, carriers have made a commitment going forward to improve fuel efficiency by an additional 30 percent by 2025. That is roughly equivalent to taking over 13 million additional cars off the road each year. These improvements will come only from our continuing airlines' investments. In fact, achieving their goal will require approximately a $730 billion investment between now and 2025, which is a high hurdle under any circumstances, but particularly in these difficult financial times. Recognizing that today's carbon-based fuel supply can only take us so far, our, our airlines are also making extensive resource commitments to stimulate the development of commercially viable, environmentally friendly alternative fuels through CAFE, which has been talked about earlier. Congressional leadership, however, is needed, and it is in four areas. First, we would hope that Congress will work to ensure that our outdated air traffic control system is modernized to permit more direct routes, saving fuel and emissions. Studies show this will reduce emissions by 10 to 15 percent on top of the 30 percent that we are already projecting for fuel savings. Next, we urge Congress to reinvigorate NASA and FAA environmental aeronautics R&D programs, additional revolutionary advances in airframe and engine technology can only come through the government-led R&D that serves to preserve America's leadership in aeronautics. Third, we ask Congress to spur further commercial development of alternative and environmentally sensitive jet fuels. And finally, we urge you to calibrate any climate change-related legislation so it doesn't work against our efforts to continue our fuel efficiency and other advances. We have got to have the capital to invest. Punitive economic measures that siphon funds out of our industry would severely threaten that progress. So accordingly, while we don't believe a further economic measure such as cap and trade is necessary for aviation, if such a measure were to be applied, it should be carefully calibrated to take key considerations into account. They include allocation of allowances to reflect aviation's fuel efficiency achievements to date reinvestment of proceeds into aviation, very important, and accounting for the reality that aviation is a global business. Closing, Mr. Chairman, the airlines have a great environmental track record and are committed to improving on that. Congressional leadership is needed. We are asking you not to work for us. We are asking you to work with us as we address the important environmental and energy concerns that we all have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. May. Our next um, witness is Tom Winmuller. Uh, he is the Senior Vice President for International Air Transport, Transport Association. Um, he is a longtime veteran on these issues, and we welcome you before our panel. Thank you very much, Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to brief the Committee on the steps aviation industry is taking to reduce its environmental footprint. Let me begin by saying that we support and endorse everything that my colleague Jim May has already said. Climate change is a big global problem. The air transport industry is a small but significant part of that big problem. The title of today's hearing signaled to me that it is important to put aviation emissions in perspective. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports that aviation currently represents 2 percent of global carbon emissions and could reach 3 percent in the next 43 years. More importantly, the air transport industry has an enviable record of significantly reducing its environmental footprint. Over the last 40 years, 
we have eliminated black smoke from aircraft engines while reducing noise and increasing fuel efficiency by 75%. Since 1997 alone, IATA members have improved their fuel efficiency by a full 20% with a corresponding reduction in CO2. I'm not aware of any other industry with this green a track record. However, the aviation industry is not resting on its record of success. We've set ourselves a target to improve fuel efficiency by an additional 25 percent by 2020, and we will reach this target by replacing old aircraft and retrofitting the remaining fleet. I would note, as has already been said, that our American members, also represented here today by my colleague at the Air Transport Association, have set themselves an even tougher target of 30 percent better fuel efficiency by 2025 and their leadership will serve as an example for the rest of the world. IATA has an aggressive four-pillar strategy in place to achieve carbon neutrality and ultimately zero carbon aviation emissions. We are confident that we will reach this greener future that we all strive for by investing in fuel-efficient technology, flying planes more effectively, building and using efficient infrastructure, and developing and implementing positive economic incentives. Some may doubt our ability to reach these goals. However, airlines have an enormous incentive to achieve these targets as quickly as possible. Today, IATA, face, IATA Airlines face a $156 billion fuel bill that represents 32 percent of their operating costs. Our only hope to survive as viable businesses is to increase our fuel efficiency. Greater fuel efficiency means less carbon. It's that simple. In 2007, IATA worked with airlines and governments around the world to reduce our members' carbon emissions by 10.5 million tons through the implementation of more efficient air routes and flying smarter. We anticipate that the introduction of the Boeing 787 and similar equipment along with promising work in alternative fuels, will result in significant additional savings going forward. However, we cannot reach our goal of carbon neutrality, let alone zero carbon emissions alone. Let me suggest to this committee what it can do and what it should not do to help us reduce and ultimately eliminate these emissions. First, we need Congress to restore FAA and NASA funding of research into lighter materials, radical new aerodynamics, and new algae-based fuels. Perhaps there's also a role here for the national labs. Secondly, we need the Congress to fund the next generation of air traffic control in the U.S. and insist that the FAA accelerate its implementation. Thirdly, we need you to pursue positive economic measures, such as tax credits for airlines and manufacturers that invest in cleaner technologies. And most importantly of all, we need this committee to avoid the temptation of imposing a barrier on the industry achieving these challenging environmental goals that we have set. For example, if the U.S. government were to pursue an emissions trading scheme that is as flawed as that being considered by the European Union, that would only postpone the day when we reach our ambitious environmental targets. The European ETS scheme is green in name only. As currently designed, it will act as a carbon tax and reduce the resources airlines have to effectively address this challenge, thereby postponing our progress. It's an illegal, unilateral scheme that proposes to address a global problem with a short-sighted, piecemeal approach. It's bad policy that will hinder rather than help us all reach our goal of carbon neutrality and ultimately carbon emissions. We urge the committee to strongly consider the positive role it can play in advancing our shared goals of a carbon-free future and avoid the temptation of taxes and charges in the name of the environment that will only postpone the day we reach these goals. We welcome the opportunity to work with this committee going forward to ensure that our shared visions become reality. Thank you for your consideration. I'd be pleased to take your questions. Thank you, sir, uh, very much. And our final uh, witness is Mr. Uh, Duran uh, 
Lovas. Actually, uh, Darren Lovas, Mr. Chairman. Darren. Challenging oh. name. So. Um, what's the name of the point guard for the Utah Jazz? Do you know? Oh, Duran. Yeah. Duran. No, no, that's right. That's same right. spelling. Most in, very, very same spelling. That's yeah. exactly right. There's more than one of us. I think I'm the only. So you're the point guy on this. And, uh, <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, and, and you're the transportation and energy co-director of the NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, uh, uh, on these uh, issues. And uh, and we welcome you, sir. Whenever you are. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today. And uh, just referring back, uh, I'm launching the Apollo program to send a man to the moon in the 1960s. Uh, President Kennedy made it clear that we do that not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Uh, uh, because the challenge is one that we are willing to. Inslee could be here. What's that? Here. I wish Mr. Inslee has written he a book. He gets here. That's right. The, uh, uh, the and whole, I, I wish he was here. That's right. That's right. Well, it, this is we're in a, a similar situation with aviation, which is central to a new choice we face as a nation, uh, whether we're going to hew to a path uh, that cuts heat trapping pollution as well as oil dependence, or take a path of dangerous uh, towards dangerous climate change. Government can and must step up into a leadership role if aviation is to thrive in a carbon constrained world by taking steps which will boost efficiency and develop cleaner altern energy alternatives. Transportation will make up 28 percent of the U.S. energy demand in 2008. Uh, a jet fuel will account for 11 percent of that energy demand. Uh, however, it will only account for about 3 percent uh, of total energy demand. Um, as of 2004, it accounted for about 12 percent of total uh, uh, heat trapping carbon dioxide emissions in the United States. But heat trapping emissions continue to grow because aviation is one of the fastest growing sectors in the economy. Uh, and those emissions are exacerbated by the fact that altitude enhances the climate forcing properties of pollutants in a, in a plane's wake. And as the witness from the FAA stated, the science is still somewhat unclear, but it's clear there is an enhancement effect. Uh, the, the size of it, the magnitude of it is, is in question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a big entity, the Air Force, is in pursuit of alternative synthetic liquid fuels, specifically liquid coal. Uh, this is like the tail wagging the dog when it comes to fuel. Since the military uses less than 2 percent of total transportation fuel and the Air Force is merely a subset of that. Uh, liquid coal as a substitute is fundamentally at odds uh, um, with other national priorities such as fiscal responsibility and climatic stability. According to the Department of Energy, liquid coal produces double the global warming emissions compared to conventional gasoline. Even if CO2 released by liquid coal plants is captured and stored, the emissions would still be higher than the emissions from today's crude oil system. And launching this industry is an expensive proposition which eat with each plant costing billions of dollars. Some in aviation seem keen on other high carbon substitutes. United and American Airlines have both gone on the record supporting the expansion of a pipeline system bringing tar sands derived oil from to the Chicago region where refining of tar sands by ConocoPhillips is directly linked to O'Hare Airport. There is also renewed interest in carbon intensive oil shale development in the West, specifically from the Air Force. Instead, what we need to do is make much more efficient use of jet fuel by taking these steps. Transition, transition to more fuel efficient airplanes and engines. Uh, which includes exciting developments uh, like the Boeing 787, uh, which I know uh, Mr. Inslee mentioned earlier, which uses uh, 20 percent less fuel in comparable aircraft. Improved air traffic control uh, can also yield energy and CO2 savings. And here I will quote Jim May, who says rightly that studies consistently have shown that modernization of the air traffic control system will improve fuel efficiency and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 10 to 15 percent. But no matter how efficiently used, something needs to fill the tank. We should either stick with conventional fuel for aviation or look for substitutes that are lower, not higher, in carbon intensity. Biofuels show some promise. In partnership with Boeing and GE Aviation, Virgin Atlantic, as they say in their testimony, I imagine, already, testified, or already successfully tested the use of a blend of jet fuel and biofuel in a flight from Lond London to Amsterdam, and Continental planned something similar in early 2009. One possible source for aviation is algae, a net absorber of carbon dioxide and a source of energy-rich oil that can be turned into fuel. Investments in inner city rail as an alternative short-haul mode of transport should be also be part of the strategy. A full high-speed electric train emits between a tenth and a quarter of aircraft greenhouse gas emissions. 
And also, the more oil we save elsewhere in transportation, the lower the need for substitutes for aviation. Indeed, energy, NRDC projects that new policies enacted uh, thanks to this Congress in 2007 will save almost 4 million barrels of oil a day nationally by 2030. That is a good start, and Congress must go further by taking these steps. First, do no harm. Uh, we need to protect and monitor implementation of Section 526 of the 2007 Energy Bill, a Federal procurement provision that provides a much-needed backstop to ensure the Federal Government does not use its purchasing power to buy fuels that produce more global warming pollution than conventional gasoline. Second, NRDC has joined five states in the District of Columbia, as well as four fellow organizations led by Earth Justice, to petition the EPA to regulate emissions of heat-trapping pollution. EPA has regulated emissions from aircraft pursuant to the Clean Air Act, but not those that contribute to global warming. As the Chairman said earlier, I believe, to the EPA witness, we believe now is the time for that to change. Uh, although there are improvements that should be made, uh, thirdly, uh, the Lieberman-Warner Bill is passed by the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee as a very strong start toward an economy-wide climate stabilization strategy. The bill includes a low-carbon fuel standard, a technology-neutral and performance-based standard for transportation fuels. And fourth, again to quote Jim May, Congress should ensure that our outdated, if inefficient, air traffic control system is modernized. The solution, as the Energy Security Leadership, Leadership Council called for in 2006, is for Congress to require the FAA to, to improve commercial air traffic routing. And then last but not least, uh, we agree with the ATA on the need to reinvigorate NASA and FAA environmental aeronautics research and development programs. For aviation, big breakthroughs in structures and engines, as well as low carbon energy substitutes, are hard to come by. The Federal Government must help spur leaps forward in technology, as it did with the Apollo Space Program. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, let, me, uh, let, me let, the, uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri for a round of questions. I have a roaming microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so one of the, uh, the in, during the panel uh, previous to your uh, kind uh, presence here, uh, we there was a mention of the fact that perhaps um, biofuels would be uh, dangerous to airlines. Uh, do any of you uh, have any? notion that at some point uh, our technology would, would reach the point where biofuels could, in fact, be used uh, in aircraft? Mr. Cleaver, uh, I think we have had some experiments uh, that have taken place already that show that uh, biofuels have some very real promise. Uh, the, what we all need to be concerned about is the, is the safety issue, in particular the exacting specifications required for aviation fuel that are uh, driven in no small part by the realities of altitude and the realities of temperature. So we are, through CAFE, as uh, others are, very committed to trying to find as many uh, reasonable alternatives as possible to include biofuels, but with the understanding and, and, and the recognition that we all have to be very sensitive to the exact specifications. We recently, our board adopted a, a set of specifications that we think are going to be important, and uh, we are very, very committed because in addition to the fuel savings of traditional fuels, in addition to the savings for uh, uh, air traffic control, uh, in addition, uh, fuel it becomes, our alternative fuels become critical. And to uh, buttress a point that my colleague uh, said a minute ago from NRDC, we want to make sure they are net positive from an environmental yes. standpoint. Well, I, th I think we, we, we do as, as well. Uh, and that is encouraging. Now, Airbo Airbus and Boeing uh, are manufacturing two uh, passenger airliners. Uh, they are much lighter uh, and much more costly. And I am wondering, um, how, how much longer do you think we would uh, it would take to uh, change our inventory to the lighter uh, aircraft using far less uh, fossil fuel? Um, I know Tom will have some comments on this as well, but we, we between I think I'll, I'll reserve judgment on the exact year, but 
over the last four or five years, we've spent an additional $33 billion on fuel. It's our number one cost center. That, that equates to roughly 330 aircraft. So it is a function of the financing of this industry, and it leads me to the point that is central to my testimony, which is we want to be as green as anybody else in this world. We think we are doing a terrific job of doing that. We need to make sure that the legislative and regulatory environment permits us to continue to invest the multi-billions of dollars in new aircraft, new avionics for uh, use in the next generation air traffic control system, which I hope will be the now generation, not next generation, ATC. Uh, and development of fuels, et cetera. So it is a very expensive proposition. I agree entirely with that. If I can put a slightly different spin on it, uh, over the last three years, the airline community has ordered 6,000 new airplanes. And today, there are about 19,000 commercial aircraft in operation. So about 30% of that 19,000 has been ordered new in the last three years. Um, the production lines for some of these new models, such as the A380, the, the Boeing 787, uh, are sold out for the next several years. Uh, as Jim said, our members have every incentive they need to be as fuel efficient as they possibly can be. Well, let me just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, before I relinquish uh, my time, uh, it, it is refreshing to have you here before this committee. Uh, I went home somewhat depressed yesterday uh, after having the oil uh, executives here. They, do, they also talked about greens, but they talked about greening their pockets. And so it is, uh, it is just infinitely more refreshing to have you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. may I comment on that last statement? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I, I, I would note that Lieberman Warner will cost this industry somewhere between 85 and 100 billion dollars between now and 2025, because we would be uh, of necessity forced to buy permits uh, for our activities, and that and the money goes interestingly to the oil companies uh, under the current construct of that legislation. So I think it's somewhat ironic that we've got this hearing juxtaposed with the one you held yesterday. Talk to our committee about that. Thank you. Um, gentlelady from um, South Dakota, Ms. Hersessan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses and the very insightful uh, written statements you've submitted and for your testimony today. I must say, Mr. May, you've made some very commendable recent hiring decisions. Uh, Thank you so much, and I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. I, Mr. Cleaver pursued some of the area I wanted to go in the direction of, of jet biofuels. Um, but given how you described you know, the investments that you want to make in, in the upcoming years, in addition to what you've already made, um, and I appreciate the comment you just made as to the economic impact of Warner Lieberman and, and being in agreement on the out goals and what we can do between now and then economically uh, within different sectors of the economy. But it is an expensive proposition. So are you aware of any support, financial or otherwise, that foreign governments uh, or agencies are providing to non-U.S. airlines or to U.S. airlines with the goal of developing alternative jet fuels, including biofuels. I don't, I'm not aware of foreign governments that are engaged in it, but you may well. The European Union has committed approximately a billion euros to uh, this type of research. But frankly speaking, that uh, amount of money is uh, a drop in the ocean of what will be needed to uh, accelerate the implementation of uh, third generation biofuels that can actually uh, have a real impact uh, on the carbon footprint of this industry. Which may go to the issue of the Air Force uh, looking at some of the synthetic fuels that are more cost effective right now. I've spoken with General Mosley about this, Mr. Lovas, and 
Uh, we know that there have been test flights using synthetic fuels that are coal to liquid. Uh, you know, my I agree. You know, we want a net uh, uh, positive uh, impact, and from an environmental perspective, I my sense is that DOD is pursuing this because while you cited some some percentages for the DOD, their largest line item in the Air Force budget is their fuel, uh, from what I have been told, uh, as it relates to their operating costs. So I think we need to address this sort of what are the short-term strategies for certain agencies uh, versus the mid-range and the long-term, which was actually one of the uh, reasonable things that we heard yesterday in yesterday's hearing in terms of the strategies that we have to pursue. But I would just make note as a response to saying that the, the investment so far has been so minimal uh, that we have to look at, again, mid-range and broad range, long range, what we are going to be able to accomplish in making government investment in addition to what the private sector is doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady, I think there is about three minutes left to go for the roll calls on the House floor. There will be three roll calls. So I do have a number of questions for the panel uh, that I'm going to submit to you in writing, and uh, and I would ask for your timely written response uh, to these questions. But I just think that the logistical reality right now uh, we'll, we'll be out of session here for about uh, half an hour anyway, and um, I just think it's probably out of courtesy to all of you. For So with the thanks of the committee, uh, this hearing is adjourned. And, uh, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Things about you. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, there we got a we got a great we got a great crew over there.